Hi, this is the recording to accompany the slides for the second lecture on the endocrine system. Let's begin. So in this lecture, instead of having the normal overview slide, what I thought, I thought I'd do is have this table for you to complete so that you can have a bird's eye view of what we've covered in this lecture. First hormone we're going to talk about is growth hormone, also known as somatotropin. So tropin means growth, soma refers to the body. So growth hormone makes the body grow. So growth hormone is secreted by the anterior pituitary. The anterior pituitary is located at the base of the brain, behind the bridge of the nose, and directly below the hypothalamus. So if you look at the two diagrams at the top, you've got the hypothalamus over here. And what you see here is that the hypothalamus releases two hormones that then travel via the hypophysial portal system directly to the anterior pituitary so that it can actually bind to the receptors on the somatotrophs in the anterior pituitary. And it's, and it's these somatotrophs, these cells, that actually release the growth hormone. As the name suggests, um, the hypothalamus releases two different hormones, growth hormone releasing hormone, which um, acts to stimulate the release of growth hormone, and growth hormone inhibitory hormone, which acts to inhibit growth hormone release. The effects of growth hormone are threefold, and they're all anabolic. So anabolic means it builds up. So if you look at the effects of, of um growth hormone, you've got it listed over here, right? The first effect is it spares glucose. So glucose sparing effect means that um, it works on adipose tissues, tissues that contain fatty acids, to actually break down fats. So it stimulates lipolysis. Lysis means breakdown. Lipo refers to uh, lipids or fats. And the breakdown of lipids um, then releases um, energy rather than using glucose as an energy source. So it spares glucose as an energy source at, and actually um, breaks down lipids to actually form um, new energy. The second one is its growth effects. So by the name, growth hormone helps to grow uh, tissues, so it promotes protein synthesis, promotes tissue uh, building directly and indirectly via insulin-like growth factors. So you can see over here the targets of growth hormone is bone cells, muscle cells, the nervous system, and the immune system cells. The third effect of growth hormone is that it is diapito, dia, so diabetogenic. So genic means formation of, diabeto refers to diabetes, and so it um, increases the chance of diabetes because it also stimulates the liver to break down glycogen to glucose. And remember, glycogen is a polymer of many, many different glucose molecules. And so what growth hormone does is it um, works on the um, glycogen that is stored in the liver and helps to break down these bonds so that these glucose monomers are released so that it can be used for energy. Second, um, endocrine gland and, and hormone we're going to look at is the pineal gland. So the pineal gland is located in the central nervous system. It's in the middle. We only have one pineal gland. It's outside the blood-brain barrier and attached to the roof of the third ventricle by a short stalk. So um, we just need to know essentially that it's in the central nervous system. The pineal gland um, contains uh, pinealocytes, again, sites refers to cell, pineolo refers to the pineal gland, and the pinealocytes produce melatonin. Now, melatonin is um, um, used to um, regulate circadian day-night um, rhythms, and it affects sleep weight cycles, appetite, and body regulation, uh, body temperature. So if you look at so this is um, the location of the pineal gland over here. And if you look at the melatonin level in the red 
over the course of um, uh, a couple of days, what you can see here is that the melatonin level increases during um, nighttime. So as soon as light stops entering into the eyes, then what happens is melatonin releases increase. And then as morning comes and light starts to stream into your eyes when the sun rises, melatonin levels drop, right? And it keeps on being at a low level until again sunset and then it decreases, right? So what happens is when light stimulates the retina of the eyes, it activates this nucleus in the hypothalamus called the SCN or the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And then what happens is it activates the nerves there. And um, then when that nerve is activated, then melanin pr melatonin production and secretion is inhibited and then wakefulness is promoted. That's why melatonin is used sometimes when people go on long journeys to the other side of the earth and they suffer from jet lag. Um, and what they want to do is they want to regulate their sleep-wake cycle. So they take melatonin when they should be sleeping. Um, and that also uh, brings me to the point that melatonin is quite a current popular aid to actually try to get people to sleep. And there are um, a lot of over-the-counter prescriptions with... Um, a, sorry, not prescriptions, um, over-the-counter versions of melatonin within, with or without other um, components in it. And um, it's supposed to um, help you sleep when you take it. Third endocrine gland is the thyroid gland. So the thyroid gland is located in the neck. So you can see here, this is, this is the neck region over here. Um, we have two thyroid glands on either side of the trachea here, um, just below the pharynx. And um, as I said, you've got, we've got two, one on the right, one on, on the left, connected by an isthmus. So an isthmus is just a connecting um, tissue. Um, isthmus, the term isthmus is also used in geography when you've got um, a, a smaller piece of land connected to a larger piece of land. And so the connecting part is called the isthmus. The thyroid gland produces three endocrine, uh, three endocrine hormones. So the first two are called thyroid hormone, and the first, um, the thyroid hormones are called T3 or triiodothyronine, or T4, which is also known as thyroxine or tetraiodothyronine. Obviously, the tri and the tetra refers to the number of iodine. Um, atoms that are uh, attached to the hormone. The third endocrine uh, hormone that the thyroid gland produces is calcitonin. And calcitonin is uh, works in together with parathyroid hormones, uh, parathyroid hormone to actually control blood calcium level. So we're going to look at calcitonin when we look at um, parathyroid hormones um, in the next um, little bit. So when we look at the endocrine gland, we've got the location over here, but when we actually do um, a deep dive into how the endocrine gland is structured, what we can see is that um, the endocrine gland, uh, sorry, the thyroid hormone has got these um, um, follicles. So follicles, this is a follicle over here. This is another follicle over here. This is a third one fourth one, and so forth. Inside of the follicle, there is colloid. And the colloid contains these things called, called thyroglobulin, which is a protein. Now, around the colloid, we've got epithelial cells, and those epithelial cells are called follicular cells or follicle cells. Next to those epithelial cells, those follicular epithelial cells, we have cells called parafollicular cells. So para means next to or adjacent to. And so these parafollicular cells are not right next to the follicles, but sort of one step removed. And these parafollicular cells are sometimes called C cells, and they're the ones that produce uh, calcitonin, right? Um, so when we look at the colloid, uh, at the follicular cells, 
we, we see here that they produce thyroid hormones, T3 and T4. The purpose of thyroid hormones is to regulate the metabolic rate of all cells, cell growth and tissue di differentiation. And what happens with T3 and T4 is they are stored in large amounts um, in the um, follicular cells. And so when um, plasma levels of T3 and T4 start to go down, what happens is this um, storage, the stored reservoir of T3 and, and T4 are released from the follicular cells and then they enter into the um, um, into the uh, bloodstream. Regulation of uh, T3 and T4 are done through negative feedback through thyrotropin stimulating hormone from the anterior pituitary and thyrotropin releasing hormone or thyroid stimulating hormone or thyrotropin. So thyroid, thyroid stimulating hormone or TSH from the anterior pituitary and thyrotropin releasing hormone from the hypothalamus. So what happens is you have the hypothalamus here that produces TRH. TRH goes through um, the hypophysial um, portal system to the anterior pituitary where they have receptors on um, thyrotropes and that releases thyroid stimulating hormone and the thyroid stimulating hormone enters the systemic circulation um, and the thyroid stimulating hormone have its receptors on the thyroid gland and that then um, produces and releases T3 and T4. So it acts via negative feedback. So what happens if the hormone levels of T3 and T4 get too high, then what happens is that then sends, sends a signal to the anterior pituitary to actually reduce the levels of TSH being released and also to the hypothalamus to reduce the amount of TRH being released. And through the reduction of TRH and TSH, then what happens is then um, the release of um, the thyroid hormone then is reduced back to normal. So that's what negative feedback um, is. So as I said, there are two different versions of the thyroid hormones, T3 and T4. Um, T4 contains four iodine atoms, T3 contains three iodine atoms. Now, even though they are variations of um, the same structure, what happens is we have much more uh, thyroxine T3 than T, sorry, we have much more thyroxine T4 than T3. As you can see here, there is uh, T4 is 20 times more abundant than T3. T4 binds to um, the thyroid uh, binding uh, protein in the plasma uh, more strongly than T3. And what happens is T4 needs to be converted to T3 for it to be active. Right? So T4, you have more. T4 binds more strongly to the um, plasma protein than T3. T3 is active and is therefore more potent, has, has got stronger effects than T4, right? And T3 is responsible for a lot of the um, um, effects associated with thyroid hormone. Right, And again, as you can see here, T4 has four iodine atoms, T3 has three iodine atoms. So the conversion of T4 to T3 is one of these iodine atom is removed and then you get converted to T, um, T3. So you see over here, just um, the negative feedback system over here, if um, T3 and T4 levels are too low, then the hypothalamus releases more TRH, triggers the, uh, the anterior pituitary to release more TSH, and then that triggers the release of more T3 and T4. If T3 and T4 levels are too high, then it inhibits the release of TRH from the hypothalamus, TSH from the anterior pituitary, and then the levels of T3 and T4 goes down back to normal. These are then the effects 
of um, T3 and T4. So not only does it uh, increase basal metabolic rate, but in increasing basal metabolic rate, it also produces um, um, heat because metabolic, um, a lot of met metabolic reactions uh, produce heat as a byproduct. All right, this is how T3 and T4 are synthesized. First of all, we've got thyroglobulin um, protein synthesized in the follicular cells. So the follicular cells, remember, are epithelial cells. They are all around the um, follicle. So thyroglobulin is produced by the follicular cells and then it leaves the follicular cells to enter into the actual um, follicle. And what you can see is when it enters or exits, so exocytosis means it exits the cell and it enters into the, the colloid, um, the follicle colloid. At the same time, we've got the transport of iodide ion from the blood in through the uh, follicular cell, then into the follicle colloid. So you've got over here, it uses the uh, sodium iodide um, pump to get from the blood into the follicle, uh, follicular cell, and then it uses um, the transporter pendrin to get from the follicular cell into the colloid um, of the follicle. Once it's in the colloid, it gets oxidized to iodine, and then iodine um, then iodinate, uh, uh, iodinates the thyroglobulin uh, protein at um, some points called the tyrosyl uh, residues. So you got iodination um, where you have the insertion of the iodide um, iodine onto the thyroglobulin. And so what you can see here is some thyroglobulins have got four iodide ions, uh, iodine ions attached to it. Others have got three. So the ones that have three then become T3. The ones that have four then become T4. And so what happens is this thyroglobulin with the iodine uh, um, attached to it then goes back in to the follicular cells through a process called endocytosis because it enters the follicular cells. And then um, what happens is you have proteolysis. And again, if you look at the name, lysis means um, to break apart. Proteo refers to the thyroglobulin protein. So the thyroglobulin protein is uh, broken up in to form T4, thyroxine, as well as T3. And then what happens is T4 and T3 then enters the blood via transporter proteins. And then once it enters into the blood, then it binds to plasma proteins for easy transport in the blood. So it's quite an involved process over here. When we look at the hormones that regulate blood calcium levels, there are two main ones. So um, we've got calcitonin that is produced by parafollicular cells of the thyroid gland, and we've got parathyroid hormone that are produced by chief cells of the parathyroid gland. And as you can see over here, out of the two, the primary hormone is the parathyroid hormone. So we've got here just a few, um, a couple of different pictures. So we've seen this picture on the top before. And so it just gives an overview of um, what happens when blood calcium level um, changes. And so what you can see here is when there's an increase in blood calcium levels, then what happens is the thyroid gland releases calcitonin. And when calcitonin is released, then osteoclast activity is inhibited osteoblast activity is um, increased so that blood um, calcium in the blood leaves and then calcium levels in the blood decrease back to normal. When blood calcium levels is too low, then what happens is the parathyroid gland releases uh, parathyroid hormone. And what happens is then it helps to break down bone because remember uh, 99 
percent of calcium is stored in bone. So when bone is broken down, calcium from bone is released. It uh, goes to the kidney to help to reabsorb calcium in the kidney to remove calcium from the urine. Again, once it's removed from the urine, then it goes into the blood, blood calcium levels released. And also through the help of calcitriol, it actually then um, helps to um, absorb more calcium from the gastrointestinal tract. So you can see over here, same three um, um, effects of parathyroid hormone are listed over here. And this is the same thing, just in a different format. The next set of um, endocrine glands we're going to look at are the adrenal glands. So as you can see over here, the adrenal glands sit at the top superior surface of the kidney. So that's why they're called adrenal. So renal refers to kidney, ad is on top, right? And so when we look at the adrenal gland, we can separate it into the cortex on the outside and the medulla on the inside. And the adrenal medulla on the inside, we've seen before when we talked about the autonomic nervous system, the adrenal medulla is involved in secreting the hormones epinephrine and norepinephrine, and they have the chemical structure of catecholamines. Um, and so epinephrine and norepinephrine are secreted when the sympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system is, is increased. So during E, e situations, excitement, exercise, embarrassment, um, and so on. On the outer side of the outer part of the adrenal gland is the outer is the adrenal cortex. And so the adrenal cortex can be separated out into three different layers. So the outermost layer is called the zona glomeru glomerulosa. The middle part is called the zona fasciculata. And then the innermost part just, um, uh, just, um, uh, superficial to the adrenal medulla is called the zona retic reticularis. And what you can see here is this, these three zones are responsible for secreting different hormones. So the outermost hormone secrete mineral corticoids, of which aldosterone is the main one. The middle of the adrenal cortex secretes um, glucocorticoids, of which cortisol is the main one. And then the innermost layer of the adrenal gland secretes androgens, um, of which andro, um, androstenodione is the main one, right? So the androgens stimulate masculinization, the glucocorticoids stimulate glucose metabolism, and the mineral corticoids regulate mineral balance, right? So again, it's in there in the name as to what their function is. So again, in, in terms of the hormones produced by the adrenal cortex, so the outer layers, what we can see here, aldo aldosterone is involved, is, a, is the main mineralocorticoid hormone. And because it's the main mineralocorticoid hormone, it's involved in the regulation of minerals. So primarily, we've got here sodium absorption, um, potassium, as well as protons, protons, right? So aldosterone is involved in the um, renin angiotensin aldosterone system. So it's the second A in RAS, um, and we'll look at how RAS is, um, is triggered. And so um, in, in, in a couple um, of slides. So um, aldosterone is released when blood potassium level is too high or when blood sodium levels are too low. So hypo means low, natrium means um, sodium, right? And then emia is in the blood, whereas hyperkalemia, hyper means too high, kalemia refers to potassium there, and then emia refers to in the blood. So when blood potassium levels are too high, when blood sodium levels are too low, or when blood pressure and blood volume drops too low, okay? 
Cortisol is the most abundant hormone produced by the adrenal cortex, and it's a stress response. It's a stress hormone, right? We talk about cortisol being a stress hormone, um, and so it increases. It helps to increase blood sugar level. It helps to allow um, the effects of um, norepinephrine and epinephrine to be greater to cause vasoconstriction and to increase um, blood pressure. It suppresses the immune system. It has anti-inflammatory effects. So um, cortisol is released when there is long-term stress. And again, with the help of uh, corticotropin uh, releasing hormone from the hypothalamus and ACTH from the anterior pituitary, it's regulated via a negative feedback loop. Stress um, causes the release of cortisone. Cortisone has effects on pretty much every cell in the body. The third type of hormone are called androgens. So androgens function similarly to male sex hormone. It can influence the appearance of pubic hair and axillary hair. And like male sex hormones, if it's released in a large enough quantity, it can um, increase uh, male characteristics, right? So control of secretion here also by ACTH and um, these androgens um, have work on the same receptors as the um, testosterone receptors. So when we look at this uh, response to stress, so what we've got here is we've got the hypothalamus and we've got the stress response. And so there is a short-term and a long-term response to stress. So short-term response to stress involves the triggering of the sympathetic nervous system to release norepinephrine both as a neurotransmitter as well as hormones from the uh, adrenal medulla. And you see here the, the short-term response to stress include increasing heart rate, increasing blood pressure, increasing the amount of glucose being released into the blood for energy, um, increasing the um, diameter of bronchioles so that more air can come in and out, more oxygen can come in, more CO2 can be um, released. Um, it reduces blood flow to the digestive um, tract, reduces blood flow to the urinary tract, increases blood flow to the skeletal system so we can run away from the bear. Right, And it also, um, because it's got an increase in glucose, it also increases metabolic, uh, metabolic rate in order for us to actually um, have more energy so we can run away from the prover proverbial bear. If stress is more prolonged, then what, what happens is the hypothalamus then activates the endocrine system. In terms of ad activating corticotropin hormo uh, releasing hormone, uh, from the um, hypothalamus, which then travels to the uh, anterior pituitary, and the corticotrope um, cells in the anterior pituitary release ACTH um, into the systemic uh, circulation. Um, ACTH then binds to its specific receptors in the adrenal uh, cortex, and then that causes the release of, of hormones from the adrenal cortex, mineralocorticoids, glucocorticoids, as well as um, androgens. And mineralocorticoids, in terms of aldosterone, help to um, um, increase reabsorption or return of sodium and water um, from urine into the kidneys, uh, into the blood um, supply of the kidneys. And when sodium and water returns to the um, circulation uh, system in the kidneys, then it increases blood volume and blood pressure. Glucocorticoids, um, when released, helps to convert proteins and fat to glucose in, term, in order to increase glucose levels. And then it acts to suppress the immune system as well um, as a prolonged response to stress. And that's why sometimes when we're stressed out long term, our immune system is weakened right through the release of this um, pathway. Now, I have mentioned the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. And so this involves several different components. So the first one is renin. Renin or renin is an enzyme that's produced by the kidney. And what renin does is it converts 
angiotensinogen here to angiotensin 1. Anytime you have something 1, you will also have something 2, right? Because that's the purpose of, name, of numbering them. Angiotensin 1 is not active. Angiotensin 1 needs to be converted to angiotensin 2 by a second hormone. And that second hormone is called angiotensin converting enzyme. It's most really released by the lungs. And when angiotensin 2 is produced, it does two things. It causes vasoconstriction of systemic arterioles. And when we look at the name, angio refers to blood vessels. Tensin refers to pressure, right? So it does something to the pressure inside the blood vessels. It causes vasoconstriction. So instead of the blood vessels being this big, it constricts them. And when you constrict them, then you increase blood pressure. The other um, effect of angiotensin II is to cause the release of the hormone aldosterone from the adrenal cortex. And what aldosterone does is it increases um, the excretion of um, potassium from in the kidneys, so it causes increased potassium loss into the urine. It does the opposite for sodium. So it increases potassium loss, but it decreases sodium loss. And so more sodium returns or reabsorbed back into the systemic circulation. And where sodium goes, water follows. So if more sodium is reabsorbed, more water then also returns into the systemic um, circulation. And when you have an increase in blood volume, then you have an increase in blood pressure. It stimulates the production of the sodium potassium ATPase pump. And what happens is then it then increases uh, sodium return while also increasing um, potassium um, excretion. This is uh, the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Again, same information, just in a different format. So you can see here, there are some cells in the um, nephrons of the kidney that are uh, chemoreceptors. And so they detect uh, changes in potassium levels as well as sodium levels. And so if potassium levels are too high or sodium levels are too low, or if blood volume drops, or if blood pressure drops, then it activates the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. And then when the renin angio angiotensin aldosterone system is activated, this whole sequence comes about. And the purpose, uh, the end product of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system being activated is you can see over here, Angiotensin II directly causes vasoconstriction to increase blood pressure to normal. Aldos angiotensin II also causes the, the release of aldosterone from the um, um, adrenal cortex, and that causes more potassium to leave and more sodium to return. So increased water absorption, increased water absorption then leads to an increase in blood volume and an increase in blood pressure to normal. And obviously, when you have an increase in the potassium being excreted, then uh, potassium levels drop down to normal. Last endocrine gland, I think, is the uh, endocrine pancreas. So the pancreas, you can see here, is located, um, nestled in, next to the first part of the small intestine, the duodenum, right? You can see this is the pancreas over here. The pancreas has both an exocrine function as well as an endocrine function. So remember, endocrine means that it produces hormones which are released into the systemic or the, uh, into the uh, circulation of blood to actually reach its receptor somewhere else in the body. Whereas exocrine glands are like sweat glands and sebaceous gland, their secretions is to the outside of the body. Pancreas has, a, has an exocrine secretion because 
it produces digestive enzymes which are secreted into the small intestine. And the small intestine is considered outside of the body, right? Before nutrients are absorbed, everything that we eat, we chew before they're absorbed. If they are in the gastrointestinal tra tract, they're um, considered outside of the body um, for physiological purposes. So as you can see here, most of the pancreas is our exocrine glands. Only 2% of the, of the mass of the pancreas are endocrine cells, right? And these endocrine cells are called the pancreatic islets or the islets of Langerhans. And the islets of Langerhans, there's four different cells um, that you can see over here that um, secrete different hormones. So we've got the beta cells that secrete insulin. We've got the alpha cells that secrete glucago glu glucagon. And the, these two help to um, regulate blood glucose levels. So insulin reduces blood glucose levels. Glucagon does the opposite. We've got delta cells that secrete the hormone somatostatin. And we've got PP cells that secrete the hormone pancreatic polypeptide, right? What you can see here is all these four hormones are involved in um, the process of, of regulating digestion, right? Some aspect. So obviously when we eat in, and um, most of the time um, when we eat, there's a component of glucose in the food. When glucose is absorbed, it increases blood glucose levels. And so insulin is released to decrease it. When we haven't eaten for a while, blood glucose levels drop, so glucagon is released to increase it, um, the uh, uh, glucose levels. So here is a, um, a diagram of how blood glucose levels are regulated by the two pancreatic hormones directly, insulin and glucagon. And so over here, when we don't eat, for a while or when we're exercising, um, when we're fasting, what happens is our blood glucose levels drop, right? So when we look at this word, hypo means reduce, glyce refers to glucose, emia means in the blood. So low glucose levels in the blood, that's detected by the pancreas. The pancreas then um, through, the, uh, through the help of alpha cells release glucagon. Glucagon helps to, to increase blood glucose levels back to normal. And the way that glucagon uh, does it is it helps to break down glycogen into glucose through a process called glycogenolysis. Again, lysis means breakdown. Glycogen means, uh, refers to glycogen. It helps to um, form new glucose from um, amino acids, right? So gluconeogen, uh, gluconeogenesis, and it also helps to produce um, glycerol and to um, by breaking down lipids. So lipolysis, lipi, lipo refers to lipid, lysis means breakdown, so it breaks down triglycerides to free fatty acids and glycerol to be used as an energy source. So low blood glucose levels, glucagon release, blood glucose level goes back up to normal. After a meal, what happens is glucose is absorbed into the bloodstream. That glucose then results in hyperglycemia. Hyper means increase. Glyce is glucose levels. Emia is in the blood. So you have an increased glucose level in the blood. That's detected by the pancreas. The pancreas um, has beta cells which release insulin. And insulin helps to increase, uh, sorry, helps to decrease blood glucose levels back to normal by, um, by moving the glucose from the blood into the cells and the excess glucose then gets stored as glycogen and it also inhibits enzymes in, involved in glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis. So as you can see here, the effects of insulin is opposite from the effects of glucagon. And that's why they're antagonistic hormones. That's why they work together to ensure that glucose, uh, blood glucose levels are um, as even as possible.
And then over here, we've got, again, the same sort of thing, um, just in pictures. So what you can see here is this diagram over here um, depicts that blood glucose levels have to stay within this range, right? 70 to 100 milligrams per um, deciliter. And if it gets too high, if it gets higher than that, then um, insulin is released, right? To do those three things in the table in the previous slide so that glucose levels goes back down to normal. And if blood glucose levels gets too low, then glucagon is released by the alpha cells to have those three effects that are listed again in the, in the table in the previous slide. So again, whether you're a visual learner or you learn best by words, um, these are the, the, uh, these, um, this slide and the previous slide um, have the same information. And then this slide over here just gives you an idea of other hormones that we're not going to touch in great detail in this lecture. But when you look at it, we've looked at erythropoietin and thrombopoietin um, in line um, when we talked about um, um, cells in the blood. We looked at, um, we are going to look at hormones secreted by the gastrointestinal um, tract when we're actually going to look at the digestive tract. And we're going to look at reproductive organs when we look at the reproductive tract. Right, and so the only the only two hormones that um, haven't been um, touched upon in any great detail is this um, coli calciferol that's um, um, produced by the skin, and it's actually the pro hormone, so the inactive version of the hormone that needs to be converted to calcitriol, and calcitriol helps to increase um, calcium. Um, absorption from the uh, in um, from the gut. Atrial natriuretic uh, peptide is probably the only organ that um, that we did. I did talk about when we talked about the heart. So when you look at here, you see that it's produced by the atrial um, part of the heart, and you see over here natri refers to sodium, uretic refers to urine. So what happens is when atrial natriuretic peptide is secreted, then it increases sodium um, um, loss in the kidney through increasing sodium um, levels in urine. And where sodium goes, water follows. So it also increases water loss in urine. And when water leaves in urine, then what happens is blood volume goes down and then blood pressure goes down. So atrial natriuretic uh, peptide is basically an antagonist to aldosterone. And on that note, I am going to finish up. Thank you.